a good day. Greeting to the Karen YouTube audience, and again, uh, good morning to those of you who are here with me, and anybody who might be watching on live stream on campus. Oh, it's a gorgeous day outside, and this is a special place, and that helps uh, because I want to recall a day on this mountain many years ago. I was uh, asked, as used to happen perhaps a little more than it does now, um, to um, attempt to intervene on a patient who was in a great deal of distress. And uh, knowing not much else than that, uh, my office was over here and the patient was housed in a, a building a kitty corner on the exact opposite end of the campus. And I knew her name was Liz. And so I went over into, some of you know, the Chen C building, and I went hunting for Liz. And um, when I found her, she was in a like, uh, you know, sort of dark, uh, isolated spot. And um, parts of that building are um, not environmentally terribly conducive to a bright um, affect. And uh, so she was in a dark place, and she was in a dark place. And uh, as soon as I saw her, I remembered having seen her in the chapel service and, and noticing uh, um, at that time we segregated patients to some degree so I could know based on where they sat in the auditorium kind of what milieu they were part of. And she had sat over there, which meant that she was part of a younger female contingent. And I remember noticing her because she had a, a rather disheveled presentation, even in chapel. And um, uh, you may not be aware, but sometimes um, it's not unusual, especially for females, to present in a disheveled way as a way of manifesting a kind of a boundary, like keep away from me. And sometimes that's wound driven. Often here, especially, it's wound driven. I um, need to stay on track, but I just remember many years ago a seminary professor saying that she had come from a subway ride and she had seen a person on the subway who was, uh, you know, leather, goth, studs, um, you know, uh, ink, and uh, just scowling. And her thought in seeing this person in the subway was interpreting that as a cry for help or attention. And I, I don't think that's necessarily wrong all the time. Anyway, that was a, that's a, a dynamic of Liz. She wasn't quite in the studs and um, uh, inked sort of extremity. But um, here I am, I'm discovering her, and uh, I'm trying to create a, a little bit of immediate rapport, and uh, it's not going well. And so I thought, uh, how about if we go for a walk? And that was a um, brief momentary inspiration of help, because I could see, she's like, can we? Um, and uh, I think she wanted to get the leap out of there somehow. And so I said, sure, let's go for a walk. And um, so we were making our way around the campus, and we ended up, some of you who are on the campus today know there's a thing called the Serenity Walk. So we were cresting towards what's the end of the Serenity Walk. It's a walk that traces the 12 steps of the Alcoholics Anonymous program. And the, the 9, 10, 11 arc of the Serenity Walk covers one of the most beautiful vistas on this campus. It's right over on the other hill. And as we got to what today is between 10 and 11, there were Adirondack chairs that were out there all the time. And I said, why don't we have a seat? Because I wasn't really ready to be finished with this encounter. And uh, so she said, okay. And we're sitting there looking out at grandeur and wonder and beauty and, um, and you know, scope. And um, I said something about how magnificent it was. And I asked her how it was striking her. And she said, I know what you're going for. And um, I paused, I didn't say anything, and she said, you're gonna tell me that there has to be a God if all this can be there. And um, I, I had an entirely different intention. And I said, because something had happened to me when we sat down in the Adirondack chairs and I was looking out and I had, she, she reminded me of the, Peanuts character pig pen. You know, like that's that's a little bit where she was like <laughs> you know, and um, uh, and 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 this I, I knew where I was I did know where I was going, but she had not discerned properly where I was hoping to go. So I, I spent a minute or two trying to say that as I looked out at this vista, what what occurred to me was that she was part of what I was seeing. 
and that just as much as any tree, any bush, any plant, any creature, any hill, any, any valley, any, any water, any sky, she was part of the beauty that I was seeing. It was a stretch. And, <laughs> and that there was nothing that she could do that would take that truth away, that she was a part of this world that we inhabit. It was a transforming moment for her and for me because, uh, I don't know, sometimes I feel like I don't fit and I don't know if you've ever felt like you don't fit or uh, uh, been in touch with the sort of like, I bleh, don't like what I see in the mirror kind of thing. But um, I often re return to that moment because I put myself when I return to the moment in the chair. And I allow myself to think, you know what, I am a part of this manifestation of a universe that has order and wonder and beauty and relationship. And so I have a seat at the table and I belong, no matter whether I feel good about myself or not. And, and that's, that's at the heart of what I wanted to speak about today because the topic in my rotation of topics that comes in front of me today to share with you is the, is the single word, acceptance. And acceptance is a word that gets a lot of attention in a variety of different circles. So over the course of the week in preparing for today, I've reflected on behavioral health studies in the AA world, in my training as a theologian, and, um, and in all of those settings, and also thought about Liz, acceptance gets a lot of talk time. And uh, so this is a large subject area, and my task is also to not um, hijack the entire 90 minutes that we have together. So I'll, I want to focus in, but I would like to just hopscotch quickly across those several domains. What I did realize early on was that Alcoholics Anonymous and its founders in 1939 in their first writings began to sort of pay attention to the subject of acceptance, and over the ensuing decades as AA would become what it is today, the parent of a variety of different recovery movements and the cousin or sibling of others. And um, it continues, acceptance continues to be a vital piece of the conversation for people in 12-step recovery and just in recovery in general. So you have the popularity of the serenity prayer as an example, and it's opening after the mention of serenity is accepting the things we cannot change. And also, there's a story in the back of the big book. I just realized that its title was not the title that I learned of it as, because I knew it as Dr. Alcoholic and Addict, but it now has a different title in the fourth edition of the book. But anyway, and today they moved this particular story. Um, there's a reference on page 417 today in the AA big book that gets a lot of attention. It's by a person early in the movement who felt that acceptance was vital to their recovery. And um, there's also a historic AA pamphlet. And it's not unusual if you go into an AA meeting that has a topic orientation for the topic to be acceptance. There are people in the room probably are going to nod their heads because I know I've been to tons of meetings on acceptance. And some days I go, oh, God, not acceptance again because I'm not in acceptance. And, and, uh, and there's obvious ways in which recovery can be about acceptance. You know, like am I or am I not an addict? But there's a lot more to the prevalence of that theme in recovery beyond the simple fact of whether or not I belong in the movement itself. As a behavioral health professional then, which I did not become early in my sobriety, but only later, um, in coming to work at Karen, I thought I knew what I was doing because I was a chaplain, so I was trained as a practical theologian, but I, I, I realized in this environment that I had a lot to learn. So I learned this alphabet soup of methods, CBT, DBT, ACT, EMDR, just, you know, there's all these different things. And those of you who exist in this world, as I say those, you know some of what they are. But it's, um, it's an, uh, an inundation of what somebody told me that I should call TLAs, three-letter acronyms. And, um, and these three-letter, four-letter, and two-letter acronyms point to methods that seek to help people in difficulty. And among them are two, DBT with its principal advocate and founder, Marsha Linehan, which is di <laughs> <I was gonna laughs> <say> diabolical, <laughs> dialectical <laughs> behavioral therapy. 
And, um, and the one that's less used on this campus, many of our patients know about DBT, but um, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's another method that's called ACT. Stephen Hayes was the co-founder, and I'm a big fan of ACT. ACT's acronym is Acceptance and Commitment Therapy. And acceptance is not only a key piece of the method, but it's part of its essential spirit. And so here you have not only AA talking about acceptance, and not only now behavioral health bringing acceptance to the table um, as important to coping with the difficulties that we have in human life, but, um, and this is so often the case, is that if we look back into traditions that existed for thousands of years, um, this is not new information. We may call it by new three-letter acronyms or, you know, or give Bill Wilson all kinds of credit because in 1939, as a person who was just coming out of an alcoholic stupor, he would you know, discern that this was a part of what he had to face. But this is timeless and true. So um, uh, two religious citations. One was um, early in my sobriety, I had a not well sponsor who put a piece of literature in front of me. It's the best thing I ever got from this guy was this chapter from a Jesuit priest in a book for Catholic priests who had sort of gone off the path. And this gentle chapter, gentle but challenging, offered the idea, it asked this question, which was, if the divine sees fit to bring you into being in the universe, who are you to question your own validity and worth? That was a really powerful question for me. And uh, to put it in his language, if God accepts you, who are you to not accept yourself? And um, it relates to the Liz question, right? So, or the Liz observation, I say. Um, you can make yourself look as messy and awful as you want, but it doesn't mean that you don't So with all of this testimony to the vital value, oh, and one other person I just took over and saw Matt, uh, another important source today on the subject of acceptance is a woman named Tara Brock, who is a Buddhist teacher and practitioner of incredible significance and note. And Tara Brock publishes a book called Radical Acceptance. And um, this book and um, uh, Linehan, the DBT person, also speaks about radical acceptance. Talks about not just acceptance of the things around us, but of that which goes on inside of us. And um, so it's a, this is a perennial, timeless topic of profound scope and significance. But I'm being asked to deliver reflection on it in this setting, in Karen treatment centers on Magic Mountain, where the red chairs on Sunday morning are filled with people who come in a time of struggle. And um, it's always important as a preacher to recognize that what are, what are the struggles that the folks in the assembly are wrestling with. And in this case, acceptance, I think, lands in a funny way because here's the deal. I'm a person in long-term recovery myself. I, didn't, I had to not accept the reality of my addiction at one level. Right? I had to understand that like, if I continue this way, I'm gonna die. And I think there are those of us who who give up and resign ourselves to that inevitable sort of trajectory. Jails, institutions, and death is what Narcotics Anonymous is. And I think there are family members who are like, well, we just can't do anything more for Jake or Judy or whatever, and we're just gonna have to watch them spiral out into the cataclysmic end of this miserable journey. So, what, I, what I came to realize in thinking about that this week was that it's true. I could not just accept my entrapment, but, but there was a thing that I didn't want to accept, which in accepting it became the first point of entry to a path of freedom, which was accepting my own imperfection and my own need for assistance. Because I had fought this thing in the best way I knew how, and I was no match for its power over me. 
I, and it's, it's, it's embarrassing to tell you what I, what I really mean in a concrete way when I say I fought this to the best of my ability, because what that meant was switching from wine to beer, or setting these arbitrary limits like I'm only gonna have two drinks, or I'm only gonna wait until I start at five o'clock, whatever, which any of you now is like, well, that's not gonna work. <laughs> but, but to me, this was like the, this was me engaged in the combat with the adversary of my drunkenness, causing DUIs and ending relationships and vomiting in the morning and all of the, there were things I did not want to continue to endure and there was a, a recognition in me that I needed to try to sort of come to a new reality with this and, and when I put on my, you know, tool belt and my, got my swords or whatever and like went to town with this, I went in single-handed combat thinking I could figure this out and slay the dragon. And I, and I, I failed miserably. And, um, and it's in the admission of defeat on a single-handed approach that other things became possible. So I had to, I had to, to come to the notion that I couldn't beat this on my own. And that was a very difficult pill for me to swallow. That was a very, very difficult admission for me to make. That was a very, very difficult turn for me to make internally. Sadly, because of programming I have, that we, have, we don't need to do more jack therapy today, but, <laughs> but I, I was set up for that, for this notion that self-reliance was how I should navigate the journey of life in the world. And so it was not just acceptance of, yes, drinking is gonna kill me if nothing changes, but it was also acceptance that I, in my own strength, would not be able to overcome that challenge. And, and, and this is paradoxical in one sense because it was only in humility and fragility and dependence on others that my dependence on a toxic, sort of partner could, could lead to freedom. And, and today, um, this is the thing I continually must accept. I must look in the mirror and love myself as I am, not as I wish I would be. And I must uh, you know, uh, gently encourage myself to stay engaged in the help that has made it possible for me to stand in front of you today with 34 years of continuous sobriety. And I must um, you know, uh, talk to a sponsor and I must like uh, seek to continue to be teachable and never take for granted that that perilous path is still in front of me, and um, and it's as really it's, it's 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 reality is just as profound in any given moment, in any given day, as it was all those decades ago when I thought of it as just uh, just the way I was destined to finish my days. So. I was in New York City for a Karen event. I was on the Upper East Side. I was coming a certain corner. If I had to pin it down, I'd say probably Lexington and 57, because that's near where the Karen office was. But anyways, one of those sort of high metro areas. And there was a gentleman who was in business attire. And uh, you know, in, in New York City, it's like weird. You do and don't see everything or everyone. But I heard this guy say, Reverend Jack, Reverend Jack. And I turned and looked at him, and he was standing there in the business suit with a, a professional-looking um, woman standing next to him. And I said, hi. I'm sorry, I really don't remember who you are. And at that second, the woman next to him said, it's Liz, it's Liz. <laughs> And I wanted to say, no, it's not. <laughs> because I couldn't go from pig pen to, you know, like this more than Lucy perfect, you know, like exterior image. It was just the contradiction between who I had seen here on that Adirondack chair and who was accosting me on the corner of 57th and Lex was just so unbelievable on its visuals that it was a testimony to what this profound acceptance of ourselves and our fragility and our inability to sort of wrestle this demon to, uh, 
to, to the end on our own strength could, could produce. And so I stood there for a couple of minutes with Liz and her dad. By the way, she hated her dad when she was here. But here she is with her dad, uh, you know, like wandering the streets of New York City. And they had this great story. She's in school, and he's doing well, and they hope to come back to the reunion. And, you know, oh, it was so wonderful being there. None of them liked being here when they were here. <laughs> so uh, you just don't know how these stories are going to turn out. And... That's a piece of something that I, I think also is an entrapment that we fall into, is that we, we doom forecast and we undershoot what recovery can be. I was told early on that my outcomes would be beyond my wildest dreams. And I thought that meant a bigger house and a fatter paycheck and a bigger car, you know, like, but it was today what I know, which wasn't on my list at all, was it's about grandchildren for me. And I, didn't, I don't have my own biological children. So that was a dream beyond my wildest dreams that today is at the center of my life. And so what I am moved to plead with you is to take the ride, take the journey, accept the help, and understand that while you may feel awful about where you are, <laughs> that it is not going to be the solution set to set yourself about fixing all of this stuff on your own. And that if you would accept the hand that is being outstretched to you by, by your being in this place with the colleagues of mine that I know are so gifted and are desperate to be of help to you that you could have manifestations of outcomes that are way beyond what you would know to look forward to. And um, this could be the beginning of the very, very best moment in your life. So just like she sat on that chair on the other side of the hill, I'm inviting you to think about when you're sitting in this chair, you belong in this very moment and you are worth everything that it involves to, to be here, to be a recipient of care, a recipient of love, a recipient of invitation to find wellness and healing, not alone, but together. That's what we're about to do. Thank you.